Hi, good afternoon. So, very first thing that I'd like to ask is, can you hear me okay? So, I, th I think that we're good to go. There's um, a big light in front of us, and so we can't see the, the guys at the back. And so, if you can give us a nod, then I'm happy to, to start. Right, I think that's good. So, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So thank you everybody for being here this afternoon. So my name is James McLeod and I'm the Director of Community at Finos. And thank you everybody for being at the event today. And thank you very much for, for Jeff of White Source um, for uh, taking part in this talk you know, with me as well. So what we're here to talk about today is simplifying the world of open source usage for financial services and financial institutions. Now, hands up if you are part of, part of a, a financial institution or a financial firm. Okay, and the people who aren't, so I know who has kind of come to our event today wanting to learn more. Is there anybody here who isn't part of financial services or, or doesn't have any? Right, so that's great. Right, so for those who um, are here and are fresh to this type of environment, within financial services traditionally, the people who are here who are part of financial institutions will recognize that traditionally um, deploying software through financial services has traditionally been slow, very much like the Industrial Revolution where products were manufactured on conveyor belts and then they would be distributed you know, through another milestone. And so you would get you know, to a, an actual release, then you would distribute it. You, know, you would take it to a factory, you would manufacture it. Then you would market it, and then that marketing would actually target your customers. And it was only really at the point where you got to the end of that huge chain that you actually got a feedback loop from your customers. Now, that is, you know, kind of like the industrial revolution model, you know, and that actually applies with a lot of other products, both within financial institution, you know, development, but also outside of that as well. It's basically a manufacturing model. But if you apply that to software engineering, and if you look at your own team, so there, there are going to be some of you in the room here who might also be doing this. So when it comes to actually producing software, your engineering teams are kind of bringing uh, open source materials into their development teams right at the beginning of the life cycle of their, um, open, of, of their um, development process. And then once that is actually done, that integration testing, so if you then rely on any APIs you know, outside of your development team, and if you've integrated into those APIs, the testing of that then goes on to another team. You know, and that, that team then just specifically tests that integration, you know, whether it's working or whether it's not. And then after that has come back, it's passed. That gets um, passed down the chain to quality testing, so QAs or quality engineering. And then when they're happy with you know, the way that your application has been developed, that will then go on to your security testing, who does deep penetration testing or accessibility testing or anything that's um, there to make sure that you're actually operating safely and securely, both within the way that you're manufacturing or developing your features, but also in the way that you are developing your open source as well. And it's only at that point through that entire life cycle that if there's a failure you know, at the end of security, it comes right back to the beginning to your development team. So if you've got a vulnerability in anything to do with open source, at the end of that development process, that's when we find out about it and that's when we need to fix it. And then we have to swing back through again. Now in order to mitigate this and in, in order to um, accelerate development, you know, we have DevOps now. And we also have automation and we also have continuous integration and continuous you know, deployment. And people who are here who recognize this will see that within the development life cycle of, of a new wave of kind of engineering and a new way of doing things that both combines agile and software engineering, we are combining um, the combined power or kind of combined intellect of us as engineers into the way that we're actually um, manufacturing our products now. So rather than having massive life cycles and huge cycle times between development, all of those manual steps and manual interventions are being automated away, both with open source toolings and also other toolings that can actually remove all of those milestones and actually shorten the cycle and get us developing extremely fast. And this is what CI/CD is. And you can go from code 
from within GitHub or another version control system, all the way through your unit testing or your BDD testing, and all the way through vulnerability scanning and other forms of security scanning, all the way through into the cloud now through con containers and Kubernetes and other ways of getting um, your materials into uh, external repositories so people can consume them. Now, in order to accelerate further and in order to keep ourselves safe, because we are actually within a regulated environment and security and keeping our consumers safe is paramount, we can then bring security into this life cycle. So what we actually have here are all of those kind of like manufacturing conveyor belt people that I represented with, you know, like a production line at a car manufacturers being brought together in feature teams. And the, the kind of cycle that's um, in the middle is kind of the continuous cycle of development that these feature teams bring together. Um, so everyone's working within one team. We're consuming from GitHub and other, you know, kind of open source repositories in the top left. And then as part of this DevOps cycle, we're doing our vulnerability scanning as well. So security follows with us. And this is the premise behind DevSecOps. So when you have DevSecOps, you're bringing the security um, capability into your team and you're running the vulnerability scanning and you're also bringing security engineers into the team as well. So we can get a continuous forward agile delivery and really shorten in those feedback loops between your development teams and actually getting things out to market so your consumers also have a voice. Now, as we accelerate fast, we also need to be aware, especially when we're operating in open source and where we have open source feature teams, that the way that we communicate can be seen by everybody, okay? And so we can move fast, we can mitigate things through automation and DevOps, but we also need to be aware that anything that we write, whether it's an issue or whether it's a comment or whether it's any form of feedback, if it's against an open source repository within an organization, that can be seen. And so say, for instance, uh, within production, we actually uh, find a vulnerability that needs to be solved by a team. We need to be really aware that if you actually highlight that vulnerability to that team um, using a GitHub issue on a public repo, then a bad actor, so somebody who wants to cause you damage, could actually read that. And so as part of Finos, we've actually come up with a responsible disclosure policy that we have within our uh, wiki. So if you go to finos.org and then take a look at our, at our wiki and also, you know, if we publish these slides after this talk, you'll come to our re responsible disclosure um, advice and policy about what happens if you find a vulnerability within a live repo. Who should you actually um, contact within the PMC team of that project team so you can have a real discreet conversation with them and they can actually take that conversation into a private space and then do the conversations and fix it and then move forward with that and then publish that fix for everyone to consume and then mitigate that vulnerability. And that way we're able to then look to the future. You know, how can we accelerate this even further? So now that we have DevOps, now that we have DevSecOps, now that we have responsible disclosure that's keeping us safe, and teaching us how to communicate properly, what next? And so as part of Finos, we are actually looking at GitOps for how we actually describe our infrastructure within repositories. So we're not actually kind of like um, creating environments time and time again. The description of the actual environment will be within the repos, with the code, within the system. And so this is how we're moving forward into the future. And if you are a contributor or would like to be a contributor into this type of model, then come and find me because, you know, as director of community, I'm looking for contributors. And then we get like a continuous, in, a continuous ecosystem of contribution, consumption, and usage from our users, which actually kind of like empowers financial services to have this real rich innov innovation kind of um, feedback loop and cycle through financial services. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Jeff, who can talk about um, white source. Great, thanks James. Thanks, thanks again for everybody for being here this afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Crum, Senior Director of Product Marketing at White Source, and I kind of wanted to take where James left off and go into a little bit more of a, a vendor pr perspective of this, only just a little bit on White Source itself, so it's not going to be a vendor commercial, but just kind of taking things 
where he left off. And he talked about the trend of basically, you know, from a more of a waterfall model into that DevOps model and then integrating security into that. And then as part of that, this movement to shift things left. So I'll talk about that a little bit as well as, you know, in, in that context, how far left can you really go? Who then owns the process of security as you move left? And then what are the right tools that you can use in order to do that? And that's where I'll give a little bit of a nod to our product line at White Source. If you do want to hear more about um, what we do specifically, we do have a table out here, and I invite you to go to check that out afterwards if you haven't already. Uh, so in terms of the optimal point to integrate security checks into the software development lifecycle, really, there, if you look at the lifecycle itself, there's, of course, a number of places you could potentially do this. And most of the vendors in this space now provide multiple checkpoints into where you can do security checks, whether it's in the planning or the coding or the build stage, et cetera. Um, but what, what we found over time, what the industry has found over time, is that the, the earlier you can detect these kinds of things, and this is pretty intuitive, um, the, the less expensive it is, the more benefit you gain by actually de detecting these things earlier. So of course, if you're gonna detect a security issue while you're in the coding phase, it's relatively inexpensive to kind of resolve that versus then the build phase or all the way down in the production phase, where if you're not discovering security issues until you're actually out in the production, it's obviously a much more expensive proposition to address that than it is earlier on. So there's an incentive here, not just from you know, productivity in terms of the, the developers themselves, but in terms of a financial impact as well into where you address security uh, defects. And in fact, you, we've seen now roughly two-thirds of all the companies that have already implemented application testing during that build or even pre-build stages. So we're seeing this trend out there in real life now where earlier stages in the software de development lifecycle is where security measures are starting to be implemented. And then, you know, if the goal, of course, is to integrate that security pre-build, then who should own that, right? That was the second part I talked about is or that I, I mentioned at the beginning here, who should own this as it moves left? Well, clearly, if you're gonna move things further toward the left into that coding into that building phase, there's gonna be a greater emphasis on software developers taking on this sort of process, right? In fact, and we've seen here 72% of respondents stating that ownership over AppSec is happening more on the software development side. So this, of course, is a natural occurrence you would expect to see in the industry as things move left. And then research shows that organizations of all sizes are shifting it leftward. We're seeing a little bit more of that movement more rapidly in smaller and medium-sized organizations, as you would expect, being a little bit more agile than larger ones. You might have larger process changes they, need, they may need to make in order to make this kind of a change. But you can see the movement out there, particularly, really across the board, particularly on smaller organizations. Now, when we get into what are, what are the right tools to implement this sort of thing. There's a lot of approaches out there and a lot of different vendors in this space now and more entering is, is it's pretty, you know, open source usage, as you all know, is, is been, you know, on the rise and, and continues to rise. So there's a lot of vendors in this space that want to get involved in this. Um, and so there's different parts of this that they'll address. But what we found, developers tools, of course, are important because as you shift left and as I mentioned earlier, software developers are taking more and more of a role in security you want to be able to have developers tools that are fully integrated into their environment, whether it's in the IDE, whether it's in the repository, whether there's browser integration, those kinds of things. Having remediation take place as seamlessly as possible. Really the goal here, if you're going to shift left, is to be able to do so in a way that makes developers' lives easier and as, less, as little disruption as possible. But on the other hand, you, want, you don't want to go completely there and leave all of the other stakeholders out. So there's a need for these governance solutions as well. You need to have a way so that the security teams and the DevOps professionals and others across the organization can still have visibility into what's going on with application security, what sort of um, severity of, of defects are being discovered, how things are being resolved, all of those things. So you really need to have both components of that in order to have like a, a comprehensive solution. And so this is where I'll talk about white source a little bit here, just for a preview. Um, when you look at our solution, we have two major components. There's a white source for developers part, which of course is a developer-oriented one, as you might guess. And that corresponds to these areas up in blue that I just mentioned, really. Browser integration, we have Chrome extension. IDE integration, we, we support IntelliJ and Eclipse. Repository integration, we have GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket support. And then we also have remediation with automated pull requests. 
so that you can build security into your workflow so that when a vulnerability is published in the open source community, if it's made available and that fix is published along with it, you can do an automated pull request and work that into your workflow so that you're bringing those fixes into your application development as quickly and seamlessly as possible. That's on the developer side. And then on the, the white source core component, which is what I was referring to as a governance solution earlier, that's where you have the detection capabilities, the automated policies and reporting alerts, as well as a prioritization capability. And that's something I'm not going to go into detail here, but just at a high level, prioritization is a really critical part of the process here. If you think about the, the huge universe of security vulnerabilities, particularly on the open source side, that's been emerging and growing over the years and getting bigger and bigger, um, being able to figure out which of those you really need to address most critically in order to move your application development forward is really key in, in this whole process. And so we have a lot of material on that because it's a big differentiator for us. And if you'd like, to, I can certainly ask more, answer questions about that or, or talk to folks at the booth about that as well. But that's a really important part as well. But the overall message here, complete solution that caters to both the developers so that you can shift left more easily as well as to the security managers and the DevOps professionals. And so when you then, when you look at the portfolio in terms of the software development lifecycle, and I had this up earlier more generically, you can see the planning and the coding components happening, being addressed by white source for developers, and integration points in the build, deploy, and maintaining your code later in white source core. So we are able to integrate throughout this software development lifecycle. And so that's, that's kind of what I had for a few slides here, just to kind of recap how far left can you go? Well, really as, as leftward as you can into that software development process without leaving out the other stakeholders in the organizations. As I mentioned earlier, it gets less expensive the further left you're able to address these kinds of things. Who owns it? By nature, if you're going to go left, you're going to be dealing with that software developer's world more, so you're going to have those folks on more of the process. That said, you want to have the right tools so that you're not only um, meeting the needs of the developers, but also the other stakeholders in the organization as well. And that's what I had for slides. I uh, don't know if we have time for questions. We might. I think so. Hi. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a really good question. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to rewind on a few slides. I will do. Absolutely, I will do. Uh, so the question was referring to this kind of figure of eight, kind of it's the continuous delivery, um, continuous, continuous integration, continuous um, delivery model, and how we actually intercept all of those various different pull requests and where they actually go. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to talk about um, is a platform that within Finos we are actually developing, both as uh, an open source um, program of which I am actually the product owner for. And so having people from within the community coming in and helping with this is actually really useful. And so when we actually talk from code into the cloud, we have something called the Open Developer Platform, which is a platform that enables financial services organizations to be able to use github.com in the public, but also make sure that it's done in a very kind of safe way, um, both using DevSecOps, but then also using um, a CLA bot, which is basically your contributor li licensing agreement. So basically, the, the life cycle of the ODP, the Open Developer Platform, is that within GitHub, we actually kind of anchor um, or we provide a trigger, a trigger using a webhook within GitHub that when a pull request is actually made, um, we trigger our CLA bot, which then looks at um, the people who have given permission um, to kind of delegate or give back the IP to that project team. Because within financial services, what we don't want is for um, people to be raising pull requests without signing, signing a CLA. 
And so this is actually quite a standard thing. It's basically somebody or a firm saying, we're OK um, with people. There we go. I thought that that would be immune to that. Right, so I've lost the slide, but I'll keep on talking. Oh, we're back. Um, so it's basically saying, I'm OK with you owning our pull request. You know, I'm going to you know, give you our pull request so you can't claim the IP, so I can't claim the IP back. So that's the first thing, making sure that legally that person's able to contribute. Then the second thing is um, making sure that if there are any tests applied um, with that actual build itself, so unit tests, BDD scripts, linting, or anything that kind of makes sure that the quality is actually really kind of in there with your agile defi definitions have done, all of these various different checks and balances, which are, are represented by the various different tools um, across this pipeline, are kind of invoked. And if any of those tests fail, so if the CLA bot comes back in negative, or if any of these tests fail, then you don't continue around this cycle, around this loop. And so part of your agile definition of done is you must have a CLA um, and all of your tests must pass. You know, whatever those tests are, and um, normally it's the development team who say what tests need to pass in order for that to happen. And then at that point, when all of your tests have passed, we then take you through a vulnerability scanning process, which is why, uh, where both um, Finos and Whitesource um, are working together, which basically makes sure that, number one, you, know, you aren't inheriting any um, vulnerabilities from open source through nested dependencies. Um, and number two, that all of the licenses that you are consuming um, through that process of you know, bringing dependencies into your project you're not bringing in any bad licenses or trial licenses or anything that's out of date. And also making sure that the version of open source is consistent and actually new. So it kind of does all of that. And when all of those kind of like uh, checks and bal balances have passed, that's at the point where you can actually go into your build. You know, so um, we're using Travis CI on ODP. But then when everything is um, uh, passed and built, we then go into OpenShift. And then we either create a container that can be passed somewhere, or we actually um, will make a deployment into an open source um, registry, whether it's NPM or you know, somewhere else, for somebody to consume it in a different way. And this is where it kind of sp spikes out. And coming back to what Jeff was saying about shifting left, with all of these checks that happen <coughs> at the point of commit or at the point of pull request, you're actually figuring out these issues really early so your team can actually fix it there and then, rather than taking it all the way down that lead time right to the end of you know, your deployment and going into your route to life, only to have to loop all the way back. Plus then, the other side effect, which is positive, is that if you can get out into production, your consumers start using your software a lot quicker um, and then you get a feedback loop with your customers as well, you know, and then, and actually that is um, a real benefit as well because you're literally taking issues or feeding features back into the team from the people who are using your software. I hope that answered your question. I just gave another lightning talk on ADP, but <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't know if we're out of time. I don't have a... Um... Yeah, about a minute. Yeah, so... Yeah, feel free, put your hand up if you've got another question. Okay, so me and Jeff are, are here this afternoon. So White Source have got a stand just outside the door here. Uh, Finos have a stand a little bit further to the left where I'll be. If you've got any questions, feel free to swing by and ask us both. But thank you very much for coming this afternoon. It's been really great speaking to you. Thanks, everyone.